of the presentation is uh, comparing an opioid use disorder associated SNP with a polygenic risk score as predictors of mu opioid receptor binding potential. And predictors is a relative term. It's really a, a, as an association um, in a regression analysis. And um, the manuscript is, is currently uh, close to being finished. Uh, Tiffany Love is actually the first author. I'm the last author, but I, uh, for the sake of presentation, put myself first. And I want to acknowledge my, uh, my co-authors, in addition to Tiff Tiffany, Andre Shabalin, and Rachel Kember, and Anna Doherty, who I mentioned is on from the University of Utah, Hung Jo and Joel Galerter from Yale. Uh, Anna Baker I, I, is from Utah. I don't, I don't know her. Uh, Jake Dubroff from Penn and Emily Hartwell from Penn and Yonkar Zubieda from Northwell. And uh, we've worked on this uh, now for quite a while. It's a complex paper and um, I hope that we can, I hope that I can present it in, in clear terms. So just to give you some background, opioid use disorder, as we know, is common, often fatal, unfortunately, disorder that is polygenic and moderately heritable. It's got a heritability of about 50%. Um, there are substantial sex differences in the prevalence of OUD and, and its risk factors. To date, there's only one replicable OUD-related variant that's been identified through GWAS, and that's the uh, A118G SNP in OPRM1, the gene that encodes the mu opioid receptor. Uh, given that fact, polygenic risk scores are of interest because they could account for OUD risk beyond that accounted for by this SNP. And I'll go into polygenic risk scores, or actually I'll turn the, the, um, the presentation over to Rachel Kember, who's going to talk about polygenic risk scores, particularly in relation to OUD. So the aims of the study were to elucidate the mechanisms by which genetic factors contribute to OUD risk and to evaluate sex differences both during a control or pre-challenge condition and during an acute stress paradigm, uh, uh, pain induced by uh, saline. Uh, the sample is 144 individuals of European ancestry, 88 females, 56 males, age 18 to 55, all of these individuals underwent 11C carfentanil PET brain scans in one of five studies conducted by Yonkar and colleagues at the University of Michigan. These are right-handed non-smokers who drank less than 10 standard drinks of alcohol per week, performed physical exercise no more than an hour a day, and had no history of recreational drug use. They were excluded if they reported the use of any centrally acting drugs uh, or medications, including nicotine uh, during the preceding month, I believe. Two months, sorry. Okay, the scan sessions um, were such that participants underwent either one or two 90-minute PET scans to measure pre-challenge receptor availability and then changes in receptor availability during moderate levels of sustained pain. The participants who underwent one challenge had their baseline during the first half, then they went underwent a pain challenge, and so the binding potential was measured during the second half of the scan. Uh, those who underwent two challenges had a uh, one challenge that was uh, free of, um, of pain, uh, and it was the first 40 minutes uh, during which the, the pre-challenge, yeah, this is changing on its own here, not sure why, it timed. Um, and, um, and so we use the same period during either one or two challenges uh, to look at both a pre-challenge and a challenge uh, scan. The, the challenge was moderate levels of pain uh, resulting from the introduction of hypertonic saline into the relaxed masseter muscle or cheek muscle at low volume 
to maintain a standardized target pain level of 40 on a 100 millimeter visual analog scale, and this lasted for 20 minutes. Uh, the genetic analysis was done uh, with genotyping on the Infinium Psych Array. Uh, principal components analysis was done for ancestral matching and population stratification adjustment, a PRS for uh, opioid use disorder, and an APRI p-value threshold of p less than 0 0.05 was calculated using summary statistics from Joe et al., which is, a, um, which is the GWAS of opioid use disorder that was uh, recently published electronically in JAMA Psychiatry and Precise 2.0. And Rachel, again, is going to talk about this in some detail. We did follow-up tests in which we examined PRS for height, which is a pure control, major depression, because many of the individuals in the study sample uh, had major depression, and chronic pain in similar models. And um, as, as with uh, major depression, many of the individuals had chronic pain. The scan data were analyzed as the mu opioid receptor non-displaceable binding potential that was measured in five addiction-related regions of interest. I feel like I'm racing the, the timer here because it seems to change slides on its own. Um, the wonders of technology. Uh, this was done using a PET and the 11C carfentanyl radio ligand. These are the five areas of interest, and I'll discuss them individually as we go through the results. The findings were generally consistent, but not entirely across all different uh, regions of interest. And this is just shows sagittal, frontal, and transverse planes. Um, for the, uh, for the five regions of interest that are demarcated uh, by color. To analyze the scan data, we used linear mixed models uh, to test the association of the binding potential with the SNP and with PRS as independent variables in the same equation. So, we looked at them individually, but the but the real air, uh, the real interest is in unique variants that as accounted for by one or the other of these. Age and the first ten ancestry principal components were included in the analyses as covariates. Uh, we conducted the analyses on the entire sample of 144, and then and separately by sex, because as I mentioned, there are well demonstrated, well documented sex differences. Uh, we used Benjamini Hochberg false discovery rate correction for multiple testing at Q less than 0.05. Okay, so the the basis for the PRS uh, was the GWAS by Zhao et al., um, in which there was an association of this functional OPRM1 SNP, the A118G SNP with opioid use disorder. It was the only significant, a genome-wide significant finding. And it was in a sample of um, about 80,000 European ancestry individuals, 8,500 affected, and 71,000 uh, controls, opioid exposed controls. There were about 30,000 African ancestry individuals uh, who were also analyzed, there were no uh, genome-wide significant findings in the African ancestry portion of the sample. Uh, we're basing the PRS on the European ancestry and looking at European ancestry individuals among the 144 that were scanned. The, the, all of the 144 that I'm talking about were of European ancestry. So the, the finding here was that the RS179971, the A118G SNP, it encodes an asparagine to aspartate amino acid substitution in the mu opioid receptor gene um, was, was genome-wide significant. Uh, this, the mu opioid receptor, as I'm sure you're aware, is the main biological target for opioid drugs. It's been widely studied. It's probably the most widely studied gene in addiction, 
Um, and um, there have been a lot of findings, not all of which have been consistent. Uh, this finding was in fact replicated in two independent samples, including uh, the UK Biobank using a proxy phenotype of buprenorphine treatment. And the final meta-analysis p-value for the variant in all three samples was 10 to the minus 10th. So it was, it was comfortably significant genome-wide. As you, as you may recall, uh, five times 10 to the minus eighth is the criterion for genome-wide significance, which is based on a Bonferroni correction uh, of about a million, of a million comparisons um, that, that are done in GWAS. This is the Manhattan plot, um, and it shows the one uh, genome-wide significant finding in the European ancestry individuals. And just to remind you about this variant, OPRM1 is on chromosome 6Q. Um, it encodes a seven transmembrane G protein coupled receptor, the mu opioid receptor, um, the SNP, um, encodes an amino acid substitution in the 40th residue of the receptor protein in the extracellular part of the member of the receptor, and um, it is an asparagine to aspartate uh, substitution. And it has fu functional effects in model systems, the most consistent finding being a loss of function. So uh, the G allele is associated with uh, lower lower functional effects, protein, uh, protein coding, and message and protein coding. This is a cartoon that shows the um, SNP. I don't know if you can, can you see my pointer that show up? Yes. Anyway, you can see there's a substitution in the, in the, uh, in the DNA that encodes a change in amino acid uh, and it changes a glycolation or glycosylation site and alters uh, the, the binding affinity in some analyses and some studies, but not all. Uh, but there are clear physiological effects of this SNP. So just to break down our sample uh, by genotype, uh, you can see that of the 144 individuals, 100 were a homozygotes, uh, and about 44 or less than a third were G allele carriers. This is roughly uh, con this is consistent with uh, population frequency of this uh, polymorphism, where in European ancestry people it's somewhere around 30 percent of, uh, of of the prevalence of the of the G alleles about 30 percent. You can see that the sample was somewhat heterogeneous. It included 74 controls and 70 individuals with either chronic pain or an axis one or two disorder. And remember, this is a secondary analysis of subjects from five prior studies. Um, so the data are being repurposed for um, this analysis. And again, you can see why we included mood disorder uh, and chronic pain um, as uh, control PRS in, in, in um, secondary analyses of the sample. Uh, this is a very busy table, but um, it shows that the, the AA and, a and G allele carriers were, were comparable. Um, and this is the 109 individuals who actually completed a pain challenge. And so you can see that they were comparable on age um, and, and on affective ratings and on their ratings, uh, both sensory and affective, of the experimental pain that they were subjected to. So in terms of the findings, we found an association of the SNP with uh, binding potential. Uh, what you can see here, are the, uh, well, you can see the whole brain, but you can see on the right a dot plot of the left nucleus accumbens, just for illustrative purposes. 
and the A homozygotes show the uh, the greatest binding potential is reflected in the orange yellow areas. The homozy uh, the heterozygotes uh, are intermediate, and the G uh, G group uh, have the lowest uh, level of bind uh, lowest binding potential, and that's also shown in the dot plot. And when you look at the variance accounted for by the SNP compared to the PRS, you can see that the SNP in the, during the pre-challenge scan, the SNP and not the PRS accounts for significant variance somewhere between three and a half, somewhere between three and a half and nine percent of the variance in binding potential in these regions is accounted for uh, by the SNP. And, and nothing, there are no significant effects of the PRS during the pre-challenge uh, binding, uh, during the pre-challenge um, scan. This, this is evident here in all subjects across the top. Um, and it's evident both in women and men. There was no sex difference here, except to the effect, except with respect to the regions, the ventral pallidum, amygdala, and nucleus accumbens were significant only in women, and the dorsal striatum was significant only in men. But overall, um, all five regions showed effects, moderating effects of the SNP on binding potential. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over now uh, to Rachel. Um, why don't I just change the slides? I think it'll be easier. I think it'll do it itself, actually. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> Leaves you with very little to do. Um, okay, so that brings us to the, uh, the polygenic risk scores. Um, and so, uh, as you saw, there was a single genome-wide significant hit in this original GWAS, um, but actually very little of the heritability of opioid use disorder is explained by that single SNP. Um, and SNPs that are non-significant, just below the genome-wide significant threshold, can actually contain real signal, but often don't show it um, because they have very small effect sizes, um, and therefore we need very large samples to see them. Um, so we can use these SNPs um, to calculate polygenic risk scores, um, which sums um, all of their effects uh, in a single score for each individual. Um, so we used the summary statistics from the GWAS that uh, Hank presented, and we used two different methods um, to create polygenic risk scores, um, both PRSCS and uh, clumping and thresholding methods with a number of different p-value cutoffs. And this uh, gives us a total of 10 scores to test. And this was all in the uh, Penn Medicine Biobank sample um, in order to select a sort of a most, the, the most predictive or the, the best associated polygenic risk score with, with phenotype. Uh, so this is just to remind you all of how we create a polygenic risk score. So we start with a, um, a GWAS on, on the left here, and uh, that GWAS gives us an effect size for each SNP along the chromosome. Um, and then we go to our independent sample, which is these individuals on the right, and we say for each individual, do they have this SNP? Um, are they heterozygous or homozygous for this SNP? And um, if they have it, then we um, uh, times the effect size by the number of copies uh, that they have of that SNP. So for this individual, they have two A's, so they get two times uh, 0 0.02. And then they have one G, so they get one times minus 0 0.04. And we do that along the entire chromosome um, and sum the results at the end. So this person here gets a polygenic risk score of 0 0.04 and the person on the right gets a polygenic risk score of 0 0.01. Uh, so as I mentioned, this was all done in the uh, Penn Medicine Biobank data, um, where we have about 60,000 individuals um, with um, uh, health data linked to biospecimens. Uh, there's multiple different ancestries, um, 
And out of this, we have about 10,000 or so European ancestry individuals with genetic data. Uh, so we tested for um, these 10 PRSs against opioid use disorder phenotype. Uh, we determined opioid use disorder by ICD-9 and 10 codes um, using the uh, summary table uh, in the GWAS study. Um, we restricted the codes to a subset of encounters that represent encounters with a physician. Um, and we were really liberal with um, who we selected because, as you can see, there aren't actually that many individuals with a code for opioid use disorders. So we only actually required um, that they just have a single code for OUD. Um, as I mentioned, we have about 10,000 European individuals. The genetic data of these 85 had a code for opioid use disorder. And we tested for the association just using a logistic regression model with uh, age, sex, and principal components of ancestry as covariates. So here's our 10 different polygenic risk scores, uh, the PRSCS that I mentioned, and then the clumping thresholding. And for each of these polygenic risk scores, we get an odds ratio for association with opioid use disorder, p-value, and the um, AUC. And as you can see here, the um, highest odds ratio and the best AUC um, was for this uh, parameter of um, p to the minus 0 0.5, um, which had an odds ratio of 1.55. Um, and just to show you what this actually means um, in terms of case prevalence, if we split the PRS into deciles, with decile 1 being the lowest and decile 10 being the highest, we can then look at the number of cases that fall into each decile of genetic risk for opioid use disorder. And you can see here, just based on this table, that there is a linear um, association of, of number of cases it's compared, to, um, compared to which decile of PRS they're in. And if we compare the top, um, individuals in the top 10% to the rest, we do have an increased odds ratio. Um, however, the polygenic risk score at this stage is not um, absolutely predictive. Uh, even individuals in the lowest decile of genetic risk um, can still have opioid use disorder. As you can see here, there's five individuals with opioid use disorder that are in the lowest decile of risk. Okay, thanks. Uh, Take that back over. Just... So we then uh, looked at uh, PRS in uh, the pain challenge. Actually, we looked at both the SNP and the PRS in the pain challenge induced changes in receptor availability. As I mentioned, this is a somewhat smaller sample, 109 individuals. Um, and again, this is a comparison of the SNP with the PRS. And just to go back one second to clarify, I think, um, for those of you not familiar with PRS. Um, there are many different possible cutoffs. And what P less than 0.05 here means is that the polygenic risk score is comprised of every SNP that was at that alpha level or better. Um, and so the lower the p-value, the smaller the number of SNPs that comprise the polygenic risk score. So 10 to the minus sixth is many fewer, comprises many fewer SNPs than p less than 0.05. And one needs to have this kind of data to have an a priori hypothesis to avoid testing for all of these different thresholds. And so that's why we went through this exercise and identified P less than 0.05. So all of the PRS findings that I described for you are based on the cutoff P less than 0.05 and the SNPs that, are, that comprise that polygenic risk score, the one we think is the best. So in looking at uh, the pain challenge induced uh, changes in receptor availability, Actually, we didn't see significant prediction um, by either um, the PRS or the SNP, looking at the overall sample of 109. 
However, when we looked separately by males and females, we saw a pretty clear picture uh, whereby the PRS were significantly uh, associated, the PRS was significantly associated with uh, greater binding potential following the pain challenge. So activation of the opioid system in all five regions, uh, but only among women. We didn't see it among men. And this is uh, shown here in these uh, scans. You can see on the left, there's uh, good evidence of binding potential in terms of some of the brighter colors, the orange and yellow, and lower binding potential among men and not significantly associated with the polygenic risk score. And this can be seen here uh, in a scatter plot. This is limited to the left amygdala, but you can see the, the extent of activation, which is a percent change score from baseline to the pain uh, or divided by the base, uh, the, the baseline to pain divided by the baseline. And you can see the slope is, is significant among women in red um, and is pretty flat among the men, consistent with the sex effect that I, I showed you a moment ago. So in conclusion, we, we replicated the association of the G allele with lower mu opioid receptor availability during the pre-challenge scan. Uh, Young Carr's group has previously demonstrated this. Uh, it's more evident here in a somewhat larger sample aggregated across prior studies. And with three homozygotes, you can see that there seems to be an effect of the number of G alleles, um, not just G allele carrier status. Uh, there were no significant associations of the PRS with pre-challenge receptor availability. However, in women only during the pain stimulus, which releases endogenous opioids, the OUD PRS was significantly associated with uh, changes in opioid system activation. Uh, and so it seems as though uh, a higher PRS, which reflects a greater genetic risk, for uh, opioid use disorder is actually associated with a lower binding potential. And the effect is similar in direction to the effect of the risk allele of the A118G polymorphism. So in both cases, there seems to be a reduction in binding potential associated with the risk condition, higher PRS or the G allele. Now, I mentioned we, were, we did parallel analyses of PRS for height, chronic pain, and MDD, and using the same model where the PRS is in the same analysis as the SNP, there were no effects on receptor availability at either time point of these three PRS, which is consistent with a specific effect of OUD PRS on, on uh, binding potential uh, associated with, um, with the pain stimulus. So interestingly, both the effects of the SNP and of the PRS were most evident in women who comprised 60% of the sample. So this may be uh, an effect of, of power, but I don't think the magnitude of the effects, which were large um, in women, and, and not significant in men can be accounted for just by a 50% larger uh, sample of women compared to men. I did neglect to mention that this, uh, the variance accounted for here is, is substantial. It's, it ranges between about 0.9 and about, and about um, I'm sorry, about 9%, 0.09, and, and, and about 13% uh, of the variance, which is, which is pretty substantial. So some possible future directions, uh, and, and this is particularly relevant given that we have a, uh, the PACE, uh, uh, which is a pet center, is to do a prospective replication study, potentially in patients from the Penn Medicine Biobank, uh, 
who are at the extremes of the OUD PRS. We can determine what uh, the PRS is for different individuals and recruit them uh, in silico before we actually tr make contact with them. And we can screen out uh, and, and limit it, the effort to only those who are eligible. Uh, we can either use the acute pain paradigm or we considered using a pharmacological challenge such as amphetamine, though I think the acute pain paradigm is a more robust one. Um, and I think we also want to evaluate the effects of uh, the SNP and the PRS in uh, detoxified opioid-free OUD patients uh, using carfentanil challenge or carfentanil scans. And uh, that's uh, everything I have to say. Be interested in your suggestions and where to go with this and other thoughts. I think that's terrifically interesting. Um, and I was trying to keep track of the slides. Did you show a sex effect on the SNP, not just the PRS scores back at the beginning? Um, I did not. But um, I can go back and I, I guess those I, maybe those were combined at that point because that's a pretty mm -hmm. dramatic effect on the PRS with binding potential in terms of sex. I just wondered if it was there for the SNP. It is not. That's interesting. It is. Oh. Hey, okay. this is Ju Ju oh sorry, this is Julie. I don't know if you're. I raised my hand. I don't know if you could tell. <laughs> I, I couldn't see. I'm sorry. Okay. No, no, no. Let, let me um, just show. Let me just show Anna Rose um, the slide. Sure. So this, um, I, I don't have the the numbers here, but um, what we saw was that there was there were more of these regions. It was it was limited to the dorsal striatum in men. And it was in the ventral pallidum, amygdala, and nucleus accumbens that the binding potential was significantly associated with the SNP in women. Yeah, so there's a, there's a regional difference, I guess. That is interesting because that means there is kind of a regional difference, but but overall, I guess, it didn't come out. I, I'm, not sure just... you can, I mean, I, I'm not sure how one would do it overall. I mean, just whole brain. But, but my impression was that the actual um, uh, effect size was actually equivalent between men and women. It's just the small differences that came out as significant. But the actual percent or, or effect size was actually very equivalent, which was not yeah, the I case for the go PRS. Back and look, I don't recall, but I'll, I'll, I'll take your word on that. It was certainly Thanks. significant in both sexes and, and in the overall. Yeah, I was just trying to keep it in my head because I'm – I'm trying to get used to the idea of the PRS scores, and it's interesting, and the SNPs as well. And it's really interesting that you have a, a pretty significant uh, sex effect. And Yankar, people who know this literature, Yankar, have you seen sex effects just in your in your other pain paradigms generally in terms of binding potential? Yes. Yeah, depends. Uh, there are a couple of things that go on uh, between the sexes. One of them there is there is a sex effect. There is also a, an effect of hormone or an, an, uh, uh, hormonal environment. So, for that was example, my next question about cycle. Yeah. Sure. So, um, in the studies that we did, uh, when women were studying the follicular phase of the menstrual cycle, so that is low estradiol, uh, low progesterone estradiol levels of about 60 picograms per ml, and binding potential was lower. No, binding potential was the same, but release was much lower in women than men. But if you study the same women um, at higher levels of estradiol, um, the release in response to the pain challenge was actually uh, the same uh, as men or even superior. So there is a modulation effect by uh, hormones. Cycle, there is yeah. Also, yeah, there is also an age by sex interaction for binding. So for women, there is across the uh, life cycle, there is higher binding uh, across. That's been done uh, in post-mortem data as well as in humans. I mean, and not you know alive humans. I mean, and um, uh, <laughs> and there is a change with menopause. So after menopause, there is an interaction where um, women binding goes below that of men. So there is an effect of hormones, there is also a sex effect that is uh, 
constant in terms of higher binding. The one of the things that I want to also um, note, and I don't know if you mentioned that, uh, Hank, is that when you look at the effect of uh, the SNP on, so we know the SNP is a risk factor for OUD, right? So we know that from the from the GWAS, but the the SNP is associated with loss of function, meaning there is less protein and there is less release as a function of, of the, um, of the uh, SNP. But the PRS is actually in the opposite direction. It's more release that is associated with uh, risk and it's only in women, which is a very interesting phenomenon uh, which we are still trying to understand. So that was part of what I was trying to put together. It's in terms of direction, but thanks. And so, do, what do you? Have, what are your thoughts about that? Well, there are a couple of things going on with that. I mean, we've seen, um, and this is, you know, we're just working on on the paper. And the two more convincing elements I've seen attached to higher release in the context of risk uh, have been um, linking it, release of endogenous opioids, has been linking it to um, impulsivity, impulsiveness, uh, trait impulsiveness, and also mm -hmm. emotional instability. So in the context of things like um, unmedica unmedic unmedicated borderline personality disorder, for example, there is an exaggerated response of the opioid system to stressors. Um, so there is something that relates to not a good emotional regulation mechanism involved mm -hmm. in this. Um, That's this is the, those are the two examples we've seen. I mean, I'm sure there's more. Of it, so but. what's happening here, though, is the betas for both the SNP and the PRS are negative, uh, which for the SNP means that the G allele is coded positively. So the G allele is associated with lower binding potential. That's why the beta is negative. For the PRS, the higher the PRS, the greater the risk, similar to the G allele, the lower the binding potential. Again, the beta is negative. That, that's what that reflects. So, uh, so but, the, not for the, but not for the release measure, I believe. But not what? Not for the release measure, for binding, yes. But yeah, no, for release. the release measure. Yes, I checked that. Okay, okay. Um, hmm, all right. We need to go back and make sure we have all of our eyes dotted. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's okay. Sorry about that. It's always, it's always tricky in terms of these directions and, yes, you know, absolutely. yeah, increased, increased release, lower potential, lower availability. It's a, yeah. 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 It's all, so, it's, so for the, but, yeah, so for lower the people, binding potential is, is greater release, exactly. Okay, so for the, for the people that are not used to looking at this data, i.e. the basic scientists like me, could you, could you just give us a quick definition again of binding potential and, and how it relates to release so we can be enlightened? So binding potential is, is basically, and correct me, you pet, you pet people, uh, basically the balance between receptor availability Okay. Well, it's receptor availability, but it's basically balanced between Bmax and release of the endogenous uh, ligand. So the endogenous ligand competes with the radial ligand, and the more radial ligand you have that's bound, either the greater the Bmax or the lower the release or a combination thereof. So if you can visualize a, a two compartment model where the first you had flow from the blood into the first compartment, which is within the, like the cell or the area of interest. The second compartment is actually binding to the receptor. The binding potential in D is the ratio of the rate of binding to the receptor divided by the rate of it release from the receptor. So it's K3 over K4 in a two compartment model. Does that make sense? Yes, it makes sense. Sure. I'm sorry, Julie, you were, you were going to say something. Sure. I just had sort of another um, uh, naive question. N n number one, does the fact that it's a synonymous or non-synonymous SNP weigh into your sort of calculation of the um, no. risk factor? Uh, the polygenic, I don't think so. It doesn't. Okay. Does it, Rachel? No. Okay. So the, the second question, I guess, was, you know, I guess people are using these as predictors. And so 
have you are you going to be using this score that you came up with here to sort of look in the biobank um, is I, I'm not sure if I caught the the future direction a, and then to try and predict whether or not without knowing whether or not these individuals um, are opiate dependent or could you do it in a way with pain management to sort of um, you know foretell whether or not someone would go on to become dependent we're we're hoping uh, to do a number of things, um, one of which is a grant that's going to be reviewed next month with um, Struan Grant in Chop, at Chop and David Raisin in neurology, and that is to use the GWAS findings to to identify effector genes from among those that are contributing to the polygenic risk score, but that are not, don't meet the threshold for GWAS. So rather than using five times 10 to the minus eighth, we're gonna use 10 to the minus fifth and look at all of the SNPs between those above, you know, with a smaller value than 10 to the minus fifth and uh, use his physical mapping, Struan's physical mapping, and then David's uh, worm model to try and, and validate candidates uh, and, and then look in, in biobank data uh, to further validate. So that's, that's one of the things we're gonna do. I, that's not at all related to PET, uh, except that if we identify um, additional SNPs, we can then begin to, we can go back and analyze the data, these data in terms of those SNPs as well. That answer your question. I have another naive question about uh, PRS and and sample sizes and things like that. At, at at the sample size you are now, which was powerful enough to help you detect these things, how how small can it go? <laughs> because I know one of the goals eventually is to do some things maybe within the the P30 PET. It seems like 85 works, but of course that's something that would be way beyond the resources of, of PET P30. So is, is the path forward to use large data sets where there's already good imaging available and get the genetics and the PRS scores? Because that's the, that's the sane way to go. Otherwise, you'd be here for a really long time. What, what's your strategy, I guess? Rachel, do you want to address that? Uh, sure. So she gets all the hard questions. Right. Yes, of course. Um, Power uh, in these studies comes from from two two sides of it. Um, the first side is the actual uh, GWAS study that we um, that was conducted that we've created the PRS on, um, and then the second is the uh, data set that you're actually generating the PRS in that has PET imaging and so on. Um, the side that we we can help increase power is we can conduct larger GWASs, um, which would then allow us to refine our effect sizes for each SNP. Um, and that would help us remove noise from the data when we're creating a polygenic risk score. So if we can get the poly, like if you imagine a world, and this this isn't really possible because the you know the environment is a thing, but um, if genetics completely predicted whether or not someone had a disorder, then it would theoretically be possible to create a polygenic risk score which was entirely predictive of that disorder, um, and all that would be needed is a large enough sample size for GWAS in order to create that polygenic risk score. And then you wouldn't need very large sample sizes in your in your PET study because, you know, each individual, the polygenic risk score would be exactly accurate. Um, so that's that's the side that I I, I would attempt to, to sort of increase the power on um, in terms of the seeing differences in the brain in your in your PET sample size. Um, I'll pass that question off to someone else. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, the, I yeah. These but, numbers but that sort of, sort of answers some of it, so hopefully. Right, right. No, I hear you. The best part of this of this has been, uh, well, it's been 
working with all the uh, all the people because everybody brought a different expertise to this, and it's really been an interesting process. But it's only been possible because uh, Yonkar and uh, Anna and 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 Tiffany uh, uh, and Andre had access to all of these pet data, and we um, were able to to get access to the GWAS that we were part of and putting it all together. And when you think about it, it was 100,000 people in a GWAS and 144 people who underwent PET. The, it's not that easy to assemble that, a sample like that. No, I think, it's, I think it's wonderful that you combine these things creatively in that way. It just feels like yeah. a really good use of, of the PET data, which is a gift that keeps on giving. And then, as Rachel says, GWAS can get larger and larger, just get more collaborators and get more data sets and, and make things larger on that end. But I'm just trying to always look at it through the filter of my humble uh, imaging world filter, which is what kind of effect sizes does one have to have to pick up a difference between uh, groups, something that would be basically in the realm of, you know, a, a de novo pet study. We probably, we probably want to look at uh, we probably want to look at about a fifteen percent difference in, in our in our binding potential between groups. I think that's with the with about um, uh, twelve and twelve two groups of twelve. I think that's reasonable. You know. Yeah, that's that's it. That's exactly that's exactly correct. Actually, I, I calculated that a while ago. But one thing to also in response to your question. Um, and Rose is, uh, if you actually look at how the GWAS are done, uh, you are looking at a very complex variable. Opioid use disorder is a very complex thing. It's a, you know, very complex diagnosis. Even if you were to take um, a, a simpler, even something as simple as like anxiety or anxiety level or anxiety diagnosis, sure. you know, you know, the the variance that is contributed by genes is relatively small. If you were to do the same thing, if you've done that, um, where you do MR, you are all of a sudden talking about variances that are being explained by genes in the order of maybe 1%, one, 1%, one percent, 2%, percent, 8%. Percent. If you look at something that is more proximally related to genes, you could yes. argue that molecular imaging is more proximally related, right? Call it, right. Know, a, a better receptors. endophenotype, like pain exactly. responsivity or something like that that's a little tighter. Yeah. So yeah. you are you are basically looking at a good endophenotype and also a molecular you know phenotype in this case right. the myopia receptor right. that is closer to the gene product. So no, all of a sudden, and, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and all of a sudden when we did that, I mean that was calculated years ago with um, substance uh, P, um, the um, uh, genes, um, the the variance all of a sudden becomes you know 21 percent of the variance is being explained by a particular binding measure because you are closer to the gene product, and I think yeah. this is what you are seeing here: uh, some right. variables that are actually more uh, more closely related to genes and, and protein production. Yeah, that's that's the beauty of of end of brain endophenotypes, and I'm all for it. Basically, that's that's hugely important and much tighter in terms of relationship than than a a, a rough disorder description, right? Even a really careful one has a lot of other contributors. Yeah. But if you can the break it down into pieces of the individual. By and large, the, I mean, none of, these, none of these individuals who were scanned had opioid use disorder. So we're only looking at their genetic risk, which is sort of a latent variable. I mean, it is a latent variable because it's not been manifest. Well, and just and I, I know you went through the inclusion exclusion criteria. So, young car and these original ones, they were actually excluded if they had a history of recreational drug use. Yes, they, none of them had a history of recreational use at all, zero, zero, nothing. There yeah, was so, one I think we excluded because apparently there was a history of marijuana that came that was not apparent when we did the interview, but everybody else was excluded. Right. So, I mean, that's a very pristine sample in some ways. And I wonder if if there would be an advantage to having, you know, that as we were talking before about having extremes that actually have the phenotype as messy as it is of the of the full disorder. Well, I, I personally believe that's the case, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Hank and... In other words, your effects, your effects might be even more dramatic is all I'm saying. Yeah. Mike. So, Go ahead, Martin. So, yes, so my question is, and, and I know that you're going to do this in part with a new grant that uh, that you're going to have reviewed shortly, but so have you looked 
<laughs> have you looked at the, those genes that come into producing the PRS, right? At that threshold that you established for these studies. And the question is, is there any indication that based on what you know about those polymorphisms and their fun functional role, are these all, are all these uh, connected functionally? So are you, are you targeting a particular pathway? Are you targeting a particular function? I'll give you, I'll give you an, a naive answer and then, and then Rachel can give you a more intelligent one. Um, there are, at P less than 0.05, there are so many SNPs, mm. you know, 200, 300,000 maybe? I don't even know. Oh, okay. Uh, actually, it's it's in the manuscript somewhere. It's a lo very large number, and the smaller that p value gets, the fewer SNPs are involved. But even p less than uh, ten to the minus fifth, you still have a fair number of of genes. Um, so so yeah, it's going to be there's a little more than a little some brute force that I think we're going to have to apply to identify effector genes that explain the PRS. Okay, thank you. Do you want to add anything, Rachel? Um, I, I think you, yeah, it's it's hundreds of thousands of SNPs that go into these things. And so, um, and, and this is a developing field. Um, I think the next step is going to be creating polygenic risk scores that are actually um, pathway specific right. yeah. in some way and that'll come from you know identifying which SNPs are causal from annotating the SNPs with pathways and, and so on and so forth but yeah there's much much more work to be done and I, and I think you know uh, Rachel has uh, uh, a K award which we hope will be funded soon uh, in by NI, NIAAA to look at in alcohol where there are many more uh, sign genome-wide significant findings, um, 40 some I think now for AUD, right? Yes. Um, in in new analyses uh, from the Million Veteran Program, um, and uh, she's going to apply a more biological, uh, a, a more systems biology I think approach mm -hmm. uh, to understanding what's going yeah, that's on. Exciting. Yes. You need many more SNPs to work with, I think. On the other hand, this was a really fun outing, and I really appreciate you guys uh, persisting through the complexities of the data and revealing some things that I don't think we knew about months ago. So this was great. Good. Thank you. I re I'm really glad that Yolkar and Anna could join, and uh, uh, Yes, young car, you have a, a gold mine in your data <laughs> of your many different cohorts over the years. There's so many ways to slice them later, so it will truly yeah. be um, a gift that keeps on giving for a long yeah. time. Uh, that data is available. Whoa, that's nice here. Okay, sorry. Uh, that data is uh, um, available, and uh, we also have, also have genetics, uh, more genetics, meaning we have DNA and. Um, um, inflammatory factors that have been collected and plasma. So there is actually the capacity of doing um, more of that if needed. So. That's great. Well, thanks, guys.